now if the, there is a link we shared in the chat. Okay, I didn't see it. I didn't see it. Okay. Happy with Zoom, you can also follow the this talk on uh, YouTube. Sorry, and, Rujan? Yeah, thank okay. you for the invitation, uh, Dr. Aikos. It's perfectly fine if you want to record this presentation. Now, if uh, there is a link we shared in the chat. Yeah, I didn't see it. And uh, it will be available on YouTube in public domain. So, and, and the goal here is uh, to share, to talk, to explore some ideas. I'm uh, pleased and I'm very happy to be in your company. And I, uh, we, as Dr. Aiko say, we went many years back and we shared similar passion to engage students, to have meaningful discussion to possible collaborations and to possibly inspire more students to do this kind of interdisciplinary work. So yeah, please feel free to, to record. So my inspiration came from uh, this place, which is named after Dr. Abdus Salam, which was the first Nobel laureate in science and technology from the Muslim world. And he was from Pakistan, where I come from. And today we'll talk about nanotechnologies for cancer diagnosis. So many of the background information or background knowledge is, is fundamental to this. So we'll go to some basics, some inspirations and some motivation why we want to do this work. As electrical engineers, many of us, we like to quantify things. We like to compare numbers. So here are some numbers. I, I show the world to, to just to give an idea of seven, 0.5 to 8 billion people on the face of this earth, right? And if we take one piece of brain, about 15 centimeter cube, that has 100 billion neurons in it. And now as device engineers in semiconductor industry, in microelectronics, they're different names, but same idea. We are creating 32 billion transistors now on a small chip, which is about maybe 2.5 centimeter to 2.5 centimeter and inch by an inch. So think about it. And now we have capabilities to make 32 billion transistors in such a small piece of semiconductor material, silicon. And that's the capability that we have achieved to repeatedly, reproducibly create devices at that scale. Now, that has become enabled because now we have technologies to create things small and we have technologies to characterize things small. So hence what we call nanotechnology or, or nanoscience. So different approaches to, to that. Now, given that, if you look back and this is a picture from IEEE Spectrum Magazine, they, they said that first 50 years of last century made major investments in radars, in television, in radio, which revolutionized how we lived and how we did things. In the next 50 years, they brought the communication technologies to us. We have fast computers. We have now a terabyte in our pockets and gigabytes per second kind of communication in uh, in our environment. And they said the next 30, next 50 years will be the, the dominance of nanotechnology, nanorobots and uh, control of molecules and, and wearable or uh, what do you call it, implantable things. I have a different approach to that. I said that major impact is not going to come from this. Yes, they are going to, and they are changing our lives, but the real change will come where human we will have control over our health. We will have control over what makes us who we are, our genetic code, and understanding and learning what makes our go sick. Because if we know how we get sick, we can do something about making ourselves uh, healthy or at least to reduce the impact of that sickness. And that has result, already resulted in many major uh, innovations. We have 
personalized genetic uh, you can get for like $50, you can get a whole bunch of information about our genes, about who we are and where do we come from. We have implants which can go into eyes, which can go into so many parts of our body. We even have artificial heart. So that has become enabled because now we can detect or we can sense things at nanoscale. We can sense very, very small amount of biomolecules and even smaller changes in those biomolecules. So this is, uh, as engineers, we think about deltas, right? So we can not only detect smaller amounts, we can detect smaller changes in those smaller amounts. And hence the idea of biosensing or, or nanotechnology applications in biosensing. So here I'm showing a few examples from about more than 15 years where the biosensing or nanobio interface started. So there were uh, reports where we could sense very small amount. So the, the picture on the right hand side is from uh, a Harvard group. Charles Libert was, was having some problems today. In 2001, they were able to detect a picomolar amount of changes in the uh, whatever analytes they had. So they were using nanotubes, nanowires in this case. And the surface charge changes were being able to detect it as conductors change. So this has come a long way in the last about 20 years. And we'll look at some examples. So now where we are not just looking at uh, DNA or genetic material, we are looking at expression of those materials, uh, which means the uh, proteins or markers or different biomolecules whose properties we are interested in. We are interested in their quantity. We are interested in their uh, folding. We are interested in their structure. And if we sum it up, our goals are very clear. In life sciences, we want to do we want to do small sample sizes, we want to have high accuracy, but at the end of the day, we want to cut down time and we want to cut down cost. Why we want to do that? If, we, if you think about a basic lab testing, a person has to go into lab, give a syringe of blood, maybe saliva, urine, or whatever body fluid they have to punch and get inside. It takes few days for them to do the culture, for them to do the reaction or, or, or to separate things out, but that takes time. And many times we want to get answers quickly. It also incurs cost. So that again, we want to, in developed world, in, uh, in cities, we can afford many of those things. But if you think about humanity, most of, us live in rural areas. Most of us, us live in areas which are away from cities. So that means they cannot afford it. So we have to reach and get to them. So here there are two examples of uh, the, the picture on the right hand side is a, is a PCR machine, a machine where we, which we use to amplify DNA, to make more copies of DNA. And the center picture is a PCR chip so we have already started transitioning to chip, which means the area of lab on chip, where we want to translate or transfer the same functionality of reactions, same reactive molecules on the chip format. So we can do things quicker, we can do things with smaller amount of molecules and we can possibly connect them and get the data to the outside world, to physician, without ever even going to physician, to caregivers. So this is the overall uh, concept or the wish list that we want to achieve. A lot of this has uh, solidified where we have a, a basic approach and we have a variation of that approach in different cases. We start with a sample, which can be coming from a living thing, human, which may be maybe the water supply, which may be our food supply. We prep this, get the 
the important things together and we put it on a on a chip on the chip is where we have the detection or identification or the what you call the selective recognition and this is an important thing that we'll talk about in another slide also and we want to get the result now when we take it to the chip format we or lab on chip these things need to be done at much much smaller scale and much faster so here are some timelines on or typical timelines so we start with a small amount of the material maybe 100 to 250 ml we want to clean it we want to get rid of uh, maybe red blood cells or white blood cells so depending on the application and then on the chip we want to do everything where well, here is a small example of a uh, and you can see the uh, objective lens and you can compare the area of the, the the green holder which is just a pcb printed circuit board and then it has the lab on chip on top of it so there are and now this is where the heart of uh, advancement is and this is where i want to focus today on on the lab on chip approach now this lab on chip has many different ways of how diagnosis is done it may be using uh, the size of the molecules or cells or biomarkers it may be looking at change in the electric charge of the of the sample it may be looking at their actual physical structure because uh, proteins they they have a structure to them and they that structure gives them the functionality or whatever uh, role they play it can be where we want to look at their uh, deformability again a, a mechanical or physical feature or it may be we introduce some molecules or some uh, particles or introduce some bio recognition which is on the right hand side and see how they behave so these are different ways of interfacing or integrating the recognition into into the lab on chip now when we know those molecules that can bind to them and that can have a recognition we would now want to uh, functionalize our chips or as you can say we want to now make our chips engineer our chips so they can focus and target those target molecules that we are interested in and and i give an example that if you have a surface and you bring your molecules in contact unless we can capture them unless we have a strategy to hold them they're just going to wash away so there'll be no recognition so we have to create or modify our surfaces or our structures nanostructures so they can have a capability to sense them have a capability to bind them so our binding or our overall chip uh, has results which mean something so we which means we don't have false results when we do that so there are many ways how sensor surfaces are modified we can uh, do etching we can uh, put metal we can have a self assembly so there are lots of ways in literature which are given but we have to understand depending on our material or our substrate that we are using depending on what we want to target we have to uh, find the best possible recipe or sop or whatever you call from literature and see how others have have done that so a little bit of chemistry involved a little bit of uh, what do you call molecular electronics involved because many of these uh, reactions or or this equipment is used for actual chip formation actual semiconductor industry so but the idea is we want to modify our surface we can use uh, depending on whatever the case so when we have that we would now have a self assembled monolayer of the probe molecules the molecules that we know are going to bind to the target to the bad molecules that we are looking for and once we have that we flow the solution they'll be able to capture those things or those entities that we are interested in 
So that capturing is what gives us uh, molecular recognition, very important thing for our sensor or our chip. Now, this is an important part on, on the, how we, it be, we become enabled to detect the important thing that we are looking for, right? In our case, we'll talk about for cancer, what are some things that we have targeted, which gives us a state of the health in a living system. Now, once we know that, that leads us to make a chip surface. So in this case, what we are using is, on the left picture, you see we have a, a, we have a monolayer of linker molecules, then we have a capture DNA, so which binds to the linker molecule, and then capture DNA has some sequence which overlaps with this anti-EGFR aptamer. So after, this is a molecule, which is complementary to which with the half part is complementary to the capture DNA and the other part is known to bind to a molecule called EGFR, which is overexpressed in cancer cells. Now, once we have that surface prepared, then when we flow a solution, maybe blood solution, only cancer cells bind and other cells, they do not bind and they just wash away. So in the end of the this surface capture process, we find only tumor cells and we don't get any, so there, there is some physical absorption, but that's where the percentage, we measure percentage of, of detection or sensitivity limitation. So the aptamers or the molecule that's being used for molecular recognition, that's something where uh, a lot of chemistry folks are working on finding new aptamers using a process called Celex. So Celex is systematic evolution of ligands by exponential enrichment. So they do that and we learn from that. We, we, we then alter that to our application where we, like in this case, we extend a sequence that can be bound to capture DNA. So this is part of the design of the sensor where you can play with molecules and uh, use their selectivity, use their binding, but also play with their structure to make them be able to uh, be anchored on the surface. On the So many different ways how this has been done. Uh, people have used electrophoresis, people have used uh, magnetophoresis where they use the they apply an uneven electric field or uneven magnetic field, and that separates out uh, biological things based on their on their charge. So based on their dipole moment, people have uh, used where they would uh, use a pipette, a micro pipette, and identify or suck in one individual cell and see the ion exchange. And people have, of course, used surface bound ligands like uh, we have done a lot of that work. Now, there are well established technologies to do cancer detection, but our goal here is early cancer detection or early screening. The idea is that many, uh, even after years of uh, research into diagnostics and into therapies, you see people are still dying or dying at a bigger rate. So this data from 2010 to 2020, you see the, the blue line is the uh, death rate per unit thousand or 10,000, I think. Yeah, 100,000. So you see the death rate is coming down, but the death rate from the cancer is going up. It's a very interesting phenomena very troubling phenomena that we are healing, we are getting better across the board, but the overall death rate from cancer is going up. And of course, there is, there is cost involved in treatment, there's quality of life involved. There is, uh, of course, the, the, the families, they are undergoing lots of uh, emotional issues. So, and, and if you compare it even with other diseases, 
we see heart diseases or cardiovascular diseases over about 65 years there has been dramatic dramatic reduction in the the death rate because of that we look at uh, uh, other diseases and i just picked up three four here the mortality rate from the cancer is still around in the same range over even 60 70 years so there is a dramatic there needs to be a dramatic change and, the, and the, that's where we say the early diagnostics can make a big difference and, and it's not just for one cancer type. I'm, I'm putting this uh, small picture from uh, NHS, from UK, where it is showing that the earlier diagnosis were versus later diagnosis, the mortality rate is shown in blue uh, shape of human. That's big dramatic difference. There is cost that is dramatically different. So in the cycle of medical diagnostics, so we get the sim a person gets us symptoms, uh, we do detection. So it happens somewhere, we just made a, like a circle, it happens towards the end of that, that segment of that circle. And then clinical examination treatment, so we have a cycle that goes on. But the problem in the current way how it is that there is, we, we don't get the information early, early enough so we can start this uh, cycle of clinical examination of treatment early. So it's very late. So I'm just pointing out an arrow that we want to bring this arrow to the earlier part of that circle. So it, now I'm putting three arrows that if we start early, we can increase survival rate, we can target tumor with great greater accuracy to make sure exactly where it is and what are its traits. And when I say traits, it makes a big difference if it's, uh, if it's the type that invades or if it is type that, that does not invade. And there are much better treatment if we do that. So there are two more cancer types given at the bottom, for, again from national uh, NHS from UK, which shows for ovarian cancer, for lung cancer, how things change. All right, so this is motivation that some cancer cells, uh, many of them are not now known. They, those cells detach from the primary tumor site and they get into bloodstream. They get into small blood vessels and then they get into bloodstream. We call them circulating tumor cells. And they sweep the, in the whole body, trying to find another place where they can stuck and they can uh, start making another colony. Now they find a place, they get into a capillary, and then the cells have to go through the wall of the capillary and, and get to a tissue of the that organ, whatever organ would be close by in that area, right? So they start a new tumor, what we call secondary tumor, and it's called metastasis. So the motivation or the or the potential is that if we can detect those from from urine or from blood, we can start that would be something which would detect cancer very early because now it's known that a few, a very small, like one centimeter kind of cancer mass can start shedding those cells in the bloodstream. And there is, but the problem is there are very few. If you look at uh, the whole blood, there are like a billion cells in one ml. And there are just about one to 200 cancer cells in that one ML. So this is a complication. This is the challenge that the number is too small, but that's where the nanotechnology can come in and have a bigger impact on how can we detect even that small number of uh, molecules, not molecules, that small number of cells while there are few, maybe five to 10 in an ML, and we detect them and we find them, and that becomes the starting of therapy, chemo, surgery, whatever needs to come there. Now, many people work with nanoscale uh, interfaces, but something interesting happened a few years ago where we saw some work 
uh, where they were making nanoscale pillars. They called them silicon nanopillars, SNP. And they were using that to bind cells with that. Now, nanotexture is something that we find in human body as well, basement membrane. So there's a structure in our body which keeps our organs in place. And when that was looked in an electron microscope, we have found there is a nanotexture kind of surface in basement membrane. Now, basement membrane is a very, very strong membrane in, in our bodies. But these tumor cells, these circulating tumor cells, can even penetrate that as well. Now, that nanotexture is possibly providing cues to those cells. Sorry about that, feeling a bit allergy here. So, which means that providing that texture may be a way of fooling those cells to come and bind at that surface. So there was more work done on creating this, so kind of a nano texture by making very small nano pillars. So the upper figure is showing these forest of nanopillars, but the lower picture shows a cell and this nanotexture surface from the top. So we also looked at this idea and we created nanotexture on the surface of a chip. Now nanotexture increased, dramatically increased the binding, the number of bound cells and the capabilities for those cells to move around and to make connections. And they showed dramatically different behavior for cancer cells when we would capture them on a nanotextured surface. So here's a picture of PDMS. So we have plain PDMS and then we have nanotextured PDMS. What we saw is that on nanotextured PDMS, the tumor cells were showing like kind of a dancing behavior. So Here's the YouTube video link, but uh, and I can share that uh, with some of the students if they're interested in. But I took the screenshot of one cell in the lower picture. After these are 15 seconds apart, so you can see the cell is moving dramatically faster, and this is the same way how all tumor cells were behaving in that uh, sample when they were captured on a narrow textured PDMS. Now, this becomes a way of capturing cells using anti-EGFR aptamer, the way I was showing the surface functionalization, and looking at the behavior of cell. Now, oh, that's the video of that one cell, which is dancing, which is moving very fast. So this is uh, made at a faster speed. If I, let me run it again one more time. So you can see the cell, one cell, tumor cell is, make, is kind of very aggressively moving it out. So we did lots of work on that, but then we said, okay, let's see if we can create an automated system. Can we do some data analytics and quantify that behavior and make the computer give a result that this cell is, or this sample has cancer origin cells in it. And, and so this, which basically means you take that surface functionalization, you capture cells, you take the video and you analyze that video using the tools of data analytics. So now what we are doing here is we are taking the, the biological difference, which would be genetic difference, which would be there, uh, of course, the cancer protein or cancer Express, overexpression of various molecules, downregulation of the various molecules. So instead of putting any stain or putting a, more chemicals in it, we look at the cells and we can compare the cell behavior. And that can be automated where we can analyze the, we can use the machine learning, which comes in uh, 
many different flavors. So we take the, the features that are the statistical features <coughs> that are relevant. And I'll show you some of the features that we have looked at. So this can give us a, a, an overall picture from physical behavior, right? So we are going from the, the chemical behavior to physical behavior and making a, a relationship with that. So it's a, just a, a flow diagram of you, you have the chip, you image it, you store the data, and then we train the computer with known data. And then, so we come up with predictive model, we compare those predictive models, and do it, that predictive model will give us results from an unknown symbol. So we, we have to do training the system with the, for those features. Now, looking at one cell, when it is moving, there is actual biological things that are happening there where the, the cell uh, has to uh, in, come up with the, so it has to recall the filopods, filopods, which helps us move around, helps us go around. So cell motility, which is a very well studied phenomena in, in, in biology or biomedical engineering. So what we, are, what we are doing is we are comparing that movement to get some answer. And this is not something new. This has been done and tried with uh, sign language, with computer vision, with virtual reality. They even came up with a game console also, what we call Microsoft Kinetics, which would look at the movement of people. But we took it down to this, uh, we took the gesture recognition or gesture analysis to to cellular scale. So what you can call that we are looking instead of a hand or human being, we are looking at one cell. So now this is the first kind of analysis where we are looking behavior of cell, which, uh, which wouldn't be possible without the machine learning tools and uh, computation devices that we have. So what are the features? So we have a surface contact area, which we can see with the microscope. We have the contour parameters, we have the extreme points that we can measure, but uh, we can put a circle around a cell. So and here I'm just showing about nine of the, those features with this boxes, colored boxes to compare normal cell on the left side and the cancer cell on the right side. So you can see from movement from the video over some time, we can compare those features that can tell us possibly what is the nature of that cell going from uh, within 15 seconds or 13 seconds. So this is the kind of live demonstration of the cell gesture analysis. So that's just a small list. There, there are many more, but 50 more features that were we identified in machine learning that from then we went from image to image for one cell and then for all cells. And that gives us uh, this N number of uh, cells and M number of features. So N by M is a, is a big matrix. So if you think about it, if you have some programming experience, you can imagine that it's a, it's a huge data database that we have to analyze, right? So. All right, so now surface captures, we had done some more things as well, where you can make a very small uh, opening into a chip and uh, it can be suspended like standing and you have solution on either side. Again, you can push cells through or you can make on a surface of, of a chip where you're, you make the bottom surface with silicon and you have a small opening and you can cover the top with PDMS. And you can measure the ionic current. All right, is there a question? Uh, Dr. Iqbal, I have a question. Uh, in terms of the machine learning part of your study, uh, you have uh, many uh, cell images like uh, uh, frames of uh, video, let's say. What kind, of, uh, study, uh, what kind of studies are you uh, 
uh, performing uh, like uh, are you uh, extracting uh, certain shape based uh, features from the images uh, or the frames or uh, like uh, uh, would you elaborate on the machine learning feature extraction part of your analysis so these are some features which i'm showing here which is of course is the shape of the cell that we are measuring the change in the shape of the cell. And then we are quantifying that change uh, in, we're using these features, which is the change in the contour parameter, the change in the contact area with the surface, what's the aspect ratio. So we make a bounding rectangle and we look at the width and, and height of that. So, we are putting a circle that can cover the whole cell and looking at the changing diameter of that circle. So yeah, it's, a, it's an image. You take the video feed, you broke, break it down, and then you identify each cell. And then you start uh, tracking each cell from the subsequent video. So it's, it has to be done it, from that video. It's done as you run the video. But the actual goal is that we should be able to do in real time, where we have a chip, you get the cells in, you let them settle, you then let them bind, you wash off the cells that are not bound, non-cancerous cells, and then you start imaging. And within half an hour, we should be able to not just image all the cells on the chip, but be able to track their behavior over that half an hour and be able to give a, an answer that what are the features that are being shown? So do they, those features are indicative of, of cancer potential or not? Thank right. you very much. Thank you. Yeah, so Thank you. That was a good explanation. And the, the rest of the, we have given a whole list of the features in, the, in this paper that I'm referring here on this page. And I'll be happy to share any of those papers with the, any of you. Uh, I've shared my email address at the start. I'll share it at the end as well. All right, so now the surface binding, there are other things that can be done as well. So I was talking about the mechanical behavior of the cells. So now mechanical behavior, if you put those cells through a small constriction, and, and, and this is just a cartoon that you have a small opening, I'm showing it squarish, and you push the cell from one side and, you, and the cell will flow and come to the other side. And before you flow, we start measuring ionic current, right? So we have current measurement coming over time. It's called patch clamp measurement. And as soon as the cell comes in, and it's a small cartoon, as soon as the cell comes in, so you're measuring current, the current would dip, the current would go down because the cell has physically blocked the flow of current. Now that can be used if the, the size of the, the opening is the similar range like the cells have. Of course, we have cells which would have a range of their diameters. But if you get it close enough, we can use it to measure data in a small constriction. So here it is shown like a pointed structure, and then we cover the top as the with the PDMS. So what you are getting for a cell when it is coming, it is seeing a small channel that it has go, to go through. And you can measure the current across that channel. So this is something in, in, in uh, cell culture, it's called Coulter counter. Yeah, Coulter counter is a cell counting uh, machine, which has been there for many years. This, the important thing here is that we are measuring current at very, very sensitive levels and, and the sampling rate is very high. Now, that gives us a better snapshot of cell's behavior when it is going through a small constriction, a small opening. And once that happens, so you can count how many cells are going through. Now, if you can make two openings and you have a surface area, capture area, like shown here, with a nanotextured area where you would capture the tumor cells. If these cells get captured, 
they will show in the inlet side, but they will not show in the outlet side, which means it's a differential counter. That's the name of the slide says. So it's a different, we call it DC3. So you run the sample and it gives you right away the number of in-going cells and number of outgoing cells, there is dramatic difference between that. And that's indicative that some of the cells were cancerous because they get captured in the middle. And that capturing is what would is happening in those micro channels at the start and at the end. So if you can look closely, the red ones are depicted as cancer cells. So it's a bunch of mixture of reds and blues, blues being normal cells. Reds don't make it to the other end and blues, they make it to the other end. So the difference between reds and blues is it's shown here on this picture. And that difference tells us right away if the sample had cancer cells in it, right? Now, this is showing another uh, data of cells where nanotexture versus plain chip. Because nanotexture has to have an impact, just like I was uh, sharing before, that nanotexture depicts the basement membrane in the human body where cancer cells are known to adhere to that and go through that. So we are emulating that kind of behavior for cells to bind to the nanotextured area on the surface of the chip. Now, this data, it's much more easy to see here. So between blood cells or normal cells versus cancer cells, we can do that with plain channel also, but we see much dramatic difference with nanotexture channel, right? So left versus right, you can see red and blue. You see more difference between red and blue for nanotexture channel. So this, uh, we have uh, tried, if we can push them faster, what happens? So if you, if you increase the flow velocity, the capture goes down. So this is just showing us data that the, so NGBM are brain tumor cells and WBCs are white blood cells. So if you push these cells too fast, the sensitivity goes down, which we can understand qualitatively or intuitively that, yeah, you're not giving enough time for those cells to react with the surface and to get captured, which means you have just sweeping them out. So that also, now these are all physical studies of the lab on chip device that how can we get the best results out of it, right? So a lot of things go into uh, making these chips or making these uh, nanotechnologies where we can uh, get the best efficiency of detection. Another approach, Sim, exactly same principle like I was showing before, but now this is being used by using a, what we call a nanopore. So a small opening into a membrane, and here it is shown uh, what says PDMS gasket, and in between PDMS gasket, there's this yellow thing just shown. So this is a silicon membrane, and we are making, uh, I'm showing it with the blue arrow, and we are making a nanopore, a micropore, a small opening. And again, same principle, the cell would be coming and you'd be measuring ionic current when there's no cell. But as soon as the cell passes through, we see dip in the current. And that dip in current is what helps us uh, identify the presence of a cell, number one. Number two, gives us specific features about the properties of the cell. So if you look at the pulse that comes, this is a real pulse from a cell. That pulse has lots of information in it about the cell type and what kind of cell it is. So this is just showing the actual image of a micropore used, uh, made by using micro technology approaches, which is standard things. And we did focused ion beam to make that uh, mic micropore in there measurement system of uh, or packaging, we make blocks and we kept, we like uh, put it together with screws and then you push cells from one side, you get cells from the other side and during, and you have electrodes embedded there. And this is the actual data of 
non metastatic tumor cells and metastatic tumor cells so you have to understand yes just finding cancer is one thing but then finding the metastatic uh, potential of that sample is another important thing because uh, uh, i i had the number somewhere but many of the breast cancer patients die because of metastasis while the the cancer tissue has been removed and the doctors have cleared them that you are okay but the original tumor had metastatic cells in it which were there to start with but they could not detect them so that's the limitation of current system but with this kind of system and is the data much more profoundly showing the red one is non metastatic tumor cells and the blues are metastatic tumor cells so if we can run through a, a this 100 nanometer thin membrane which has a micropore opening in it we can detect all metastatic cells through that which means we would not lose a single cell from our detection all right so this another small project which we did with the real patient uh, samples also looking at the heterogeneity of or uh, heterogeneity like looking at all the different types of sub tumors in a patient sample brain tumor patient and it's important because many times when they are doing biopsy or, or when they are doing the operation for patients especially like brain tumor they had the brain open and they are removing the tissue they do not remove more tissue than needed and they do not leave any tumor cells behind but how do we know the tumor margin so yes so they can use dyes but that can leave some of the cells few number of cells but if you take the sample and in real time we can run through a a micropore kind of chip we can of course visually see the diameter but we can see their translocation time and peak amplitude which is the micropore data and that can tell us if a sample or a slice that have been removed from a brain sample if it still has some of the cancer cells cells in that because unless you are clear of cancer cells they keep on removing one slice after slice so when there is the slice doesn't have it it means they should not remove any more slice or any more part of the brain because brain we can lose functions if they take away more than needed from human brain right so this has been some work which done with real uh, actual patients during the surgery kind of thing all right so i think this probably you should stop here leave some time for question answers so again going back to the goal why we do this we want to cut down time we want to cut down cost so patients who want to get the results faster and this is the ultimate goal or or especially for cancer we want to get results quicker we want to get results in the early stages of the disease we want to come up with screening tools that everybody can afford right so these are what makes it fascinating for uh, people like us that we want to work on uh, newer tools for cancer diagnostic so this way i'll stop and thank you for your attention and i look forward to answer a few questions thank you very much this was really yeah, an inspiring this... talk uh, toy jam please proceed uh, thank you so much samir ojan this is a very inspiring talk uh, i think all the students and the listeners uh, benefited from it uh, so we can take some questions uh, i see emin aliyev let's go your question may i ask a question yeah go ahead um i want to ask like um why the, there was a difference in the amplitude between the cells uh, between the metastatic cells and the um other like usual cancer cells kind of like so there was the, a difference right there was like six um nanometers i think and three yeah right right it's a very important question very very good observation so 
you have to think about a cell versus cell. So cancer cells are more pliable. They can go through narrow places, and that's the reason they can better stay aside. So we understand that they were going through, uh, and here's the, the figure, right? This is what you're talking about. So they can have a more uh, quicker passage through the cells. Now, when, when if you think about the, the whole, this nanopore, sorry, micropore, and the cell that is going through, it also depends on how much of the area it is blocking and how fast it can go through. So think about a hard ball versus a soft ball, smaller ball versus a bigger ball. So the width and the amplitude is indicative of cells pliability and cells overall ionic charge it may be carrying. So tumor cells are known to be more negatively charged. They have uh, salic acid in, uh, kind of uh, growth with them. So we feel that they may be contributing to the flow of charge and hence the peak is not too deep. That's number one. Number two, they may be easily passing through the micropore, hence the width is not too big, like normal, well, like non-metastatic tumor cells. So there is difference between cancer cell to cancer cell on charge and on their uh, flexibility. Thank you. Or yeah. deformability. Yeah. Thank you for your answer. Uh, yeah. Um, also, uh, may I ask one more question? I just want to clarify. Um, what, can the normal cells pass through this hole? And if so, yeah. It... yeah, yeah, we have data on normal cell versus cancer cell also. Yeah, oh, so they yeah. also have different. Uh, yeah, sorry, go on. So, you have to remember that we are preparing the sample ourselves, right? So, that was the idea to start with that we do off chip preparation of samples before we bring it through. So when we do that, which means we know there would be some normal cells and we have done characterization of normal cells also. So I didn't show that data, but yeah, they show very different, dramatically different behavior between normal cells versus cancer cells. And then between within cancer cells, between metastatic and non-metastatic tumor cells. Thank you very much, I understood now. There is another question from Said Ahmed. Yeah, I'm audible, sir. Yeah, you can hear. Please go. Ahead. Uh, sir, my question is, uh, sir, what do you think are the future trends for cancer uh, nanotherapy? Uh, Fifteen years from now, scenario like which area will develop uh, further and gain momentum? Like uh, which one, when will be showing less interest, sir? So major target, major hopes, and which major boundaries are? So there are three things that come to my mind. Number one is non-invasive. It has to stay outside of the body. Nobody likes devices inside the body. We as humans don't like it. So it will be non-invasive, which brings up what can we do outside the body. It can be uh, ultrasounds. It can be... Uh, audio sound, right? So there is an area of audio sound research where we can, we should be able to <clears throat> look at what's flowing in our body from outside the body, wearable devices. Why th does that become important? Because they can connect and they can get the data to people within your surroundings or even away to the doctor's clinic. And that means more uh, machine learning, more data analytics. So from that small amount of data, we should be able to make big decisions on the type of the sample. So these are three, four directions. Now, nanobio interface is going to grow always. Where we, we work with biochemists, where we are finding new ways of uh, identifying disease, right? We are finding new molecules that are becoming indicative of health state, state right? So that's ongoing work. That's always going to go. But where dramatic changes would come would be non-invasive uh, real-time detection using uh, other kind of approaches, other kind of interfaces with living things. Thank you, sir. Right. 
Any yeah. other question? Uh, yes, Hojam, I have a question if it's possible. Okay, yes, please. Uh, Hojam, given the small amount or small count of cancer cells in each sample that you take, you mentioned it was less than 1,200. Um, how can you be, or how can you guarantee the results of your, of your test, or how can you guarantee that uh, you can detect cancer cells so early on, especially when they are smaller, they shed less, that you, like you mentioned? Right. So that, that's an important question, verification, right? So when you make a claim, how do we verify? This has been, for all cases, this has been done where we, we start with known sample, like machine learning, right? So you have to train the system. So we start with known sample, and then we once we have established a baseline, we know how the data should look, or what should be, how to interpret that data given from the known samples. Then we go with the unknown samples. And that's where we, we have this blind experiments where the measurement is done without knowing what's, what does it contain. And after the results, then we find out what the original sample contained. And that's where we, we verify and validate the results. Once you do that, then we go for fully randomized trials, fully randomized ways. And that was the data I was showing where uh, the patient samples have been used, where we didn't know before doing the other uh, established technologies to know, to validate what we were getting. So yeah, it's a, there is a whole process of how do you, in the design of experiments, you define how would you validate the results of the experiments. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. So I'm sharing my slide, if you can see. Can you see my slide? Yeah, there's the email address. So I'll be happy if you would like to know more, if you want to have access to some papers or uh, any way I can help. And uh, Again, this the goal is to, to explore and to have uh, exchange of ideas to maybe inspire more people, inspire ourselves in these days when we are stuck at home and not doing many more things outside. So. Dr. Iqbal, thank you very much for yeah. this nice presentation. Thank you. My so pleasure. Thank you. It, was, it was great to have you uh, in our department seminar. It was my pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ajam. I'm, I'm really happy uh, as someone who started this organization. I'm really, really happy <laughs> uh, to hear this presentation. Uh, at some day, uh, I would like to meet you in person as well. Thank you very much. Sure yeah, you. I used to come two, three times a year to Turkey. We'll start yeah. doing that again. <laughs> <laughs> Inshallah. Inshallah. It's <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank